In the GameCube remake of the first Resident Evil, there is a hallway. You think you know this hallway, you think you know what's coming. You may have already seen some of the new parts of the mansion compared to the original, so you know some things will be different. But to reach this point, you also have to have seen the introduction of the first zombie. A scene that is recreated almost exactly the way it was in the original. A scene that is simply too iconic to change. So in this hallway, you expect another iconic moment to be recreated just as it was before. Only it isn't. It has been over 20 years since I first experienced this remade hallway. I have played it dozens of times since then. I know exactly what will happen and what will not happen, and yet every time, I am on edge. In the original, a dog bursts through this window. In the remake, it does not. Instead, this happens. You hear the thunder outside, your footsteps on the carpet. The tension is palpable. If you're like me, you will stay in this room to retrieve some items from under the furniture. I know that I'm safe to do this, but every damn time, I do not feel safe while I do. And all these years later, it makes me wonder, how can a game make me feel this way? I know this game so well, that I once speed ran the whole thing in my head to pass the time whilst I was in a CAT scanner for 30 minutes. And yet, all of that knowledge means nothing whenever I step into this hallway. The first time at least, the second time is a little different. The horror genre has always been fascinating to me. In one sense, there are so many ways in which it can be expressed, ranging from ghost stories to real-life dangers to murderous censured cabbage patch kits. What really intrigues me though is why people like horror in the first place. And yes, I do include myself in this. Our society is built on rules, and two of the biggest are deterring people from harming others and safeguarding a person's right to live in peace and safety. Wars have been fought, countless lives have been sacrificed, entire ways of life have been erased and restarted, and erased and restarted again, so that we the people of today can know a way of life that does not have to include being afraid. And so it begs the question, why would any person in the modern civilized world want to experience fear? Whilst fear does come from the mind, it also extends to our bodies. During frightening situations, your body releases stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. Your heart rate becomes elevated. Your blood flow to your limbs is increased, making it easier for you to use your arms to fight back or your legs to run for your life, hence fight or flight. When you experience fear through a piece of entertainment, say a frightening film or a documentary exploring the darker, more taboo sides of humanity, that fear is experienced as a journey with a beginning, middle and end. The benefit of this is that the ending will, usually, resolve the situation in some way, triggering a dopamine release, a cathartic reward. Horror entertainment is a way to achieve this level of mental and physical stimulation from a position of safety, without having to actually flee or fight for your life. Horror in a video game is of course distinct from horror on the silver screen, because you control the outcome. You are in the thick of the story, and you are responsible for every action and therefore every consequence the protagonist makes and has to deal with. But so what, right? Isn't this just a description of how video games work in general? How are horror games any different? It is all about how the experience is delivered. Horror games are designed to trigger the release of the right neurotransmitters and hormones in our bodies to evoke feelings of fear. And there are a whole host of techniques and tricks that game developers use to achieve this, and that is what we are going to be talking about today. Now horror itself is a broad genre, notably so in the video game arena. So instead of focusing on what makes a game classifiable as horror, I will instead be focusing on what makes a game scary. As most of you will no doubt already know, assigning a survival horror label to something does not automatically equal a scary experience. 
When a game manages to scare you, it elicits that sense of fear in you that gives you the neurochemical rush that you have been craving. Which is not what this is. Facing off against a big scary monster is one thing, but until that moment does happen, your brain will be in overdrive at the possibility of what might happen. Arguably anything you build up in your head will be far worse than the reality, because of the amount of anxiety you will attach to the unknown. Often you will start out in some kind of isolated environment, investigating the last team that went missing, or a lost loved one or some such, and that premise will immediately put you on edge. The environment will likely be quiet, there might be some ambient mechanical noise, and the tension will build until you come face to face with your introductory horror. In the early days, games like Resident Evil achieved a persistent state of anxiety through the use of fixed camera angles. What you saw was what you got, and most of the time you usually wouldn't ever see anything else until you advanced. You literally had no choice but to push on into the unknown for the entire game. With modern hardware comes a far greater control of lighting, which allows game developers to properly utilise something that is the most natural and most effective hiding place for the unknown, something which has frightened our species since we first came to be. I am talking, of course, about the dark. Generally speaking, people are not afraid of the dark. There are, of course, exceptions, but for most people, they are afraid of what could be concealed in that darkness. They are afraid of the unknown, and darkness is the unknown in stealth mode. Nyctophobia stems from a startle response in the brain, which can heighten your perception of anxiety. This doesn't just mean putting a character in a pitch black environment and hoping for the best. It means giving them just enough lighting to be able to act, but not enough to know everything that is going on around them. A popular method for achieving this is localized light that shows you exactly what you need to see but only in a narrow beam and in the direction you're facing. Typically, the humble torch. If we look at the Dead Space remake, the devs used a variety of lighting tricks to achieve very low levels of lighting beyond the torch beam activated when you aim your weapon. There are different levels of ambient light from emergency lighting, the starlight of space, and the lighting from machinery. My favourite trick, however, was when you installed massive batteries and rerouted power to different facets of the area say, the gravity or a lift, because even when you could power on the lights, you would often eventually need to sacrifice them to power whatever other device you needed to advance. Light is safe, dark is danger. It's one of the first lessons we learn as children. Knowing that I was about to plunge myself into darkness, it heightened that anxiety and put me on edge every time. The thing about darkness, though, you will eventually adjust to it. To keep up that anxiety, you need more, and this is where we engage another of the sensors and turn to sound design. One of the staples of the early Resident Evil games was the door opening animations. In the original, as you reach the middle of the animation, you would hear sound from the room you were about to enter. And as a child, that really weirded me out. It was just enough to evoke some kind of primal response at being able to hear something I couldn't see, even though it was only for about half a second. In the remake, they changed this, and instead, there is complete silence from the room beyond. Somehow, mixing this in with all the different sounds of all the different doors ratchets up the tension even more. Once again, playing on our fears of the unknown. For scary games, less tends to be more. The wind whistling outside, maybe a tap on a window, the echoes of your own footsteps, the low rumbling of nearby machinery, a mechanical echo in a nearby vents. All of this will set off your imagination. You never know which, if any, of these noises are being made by something that wants to kill you. In the games that I've been playing at least, it's also a popular move to include a grandfather clock. Now being teased is all well and good, but eventually there has to be a payoff. 
Eventually, every game will make the unknown the known. So with that in mind, once the veil has been lifted, once you have seen that very first zombie, or watch that very first necromorph skewer your teammate, how do you keep up the fear in the face of the known? One way to do this is the disempowerment of your protagonist. Most video games, and to be fair many forms of entertainment, feature some element of challenge, but it often comes in the form of a power fantasy. Horror games don't want this, they want to take your power away. In some games your power is taken away from you completely, and your only options are to run and hide, and this is the purest form of disempowerment. More commonly, you will have the means to defend yourself, but these means will be limited. The original Resident Evil started you out with an M9 Beretta handgun, a staple of 80s and 90s action movies. You might think you'll be okay. After all, Bruce Willis saved Christmas with the same gun, but he wasn't fighting zombies that need half of the bullets in your magazine to stop just one of them. Even though you are armed, you are still vulnerable. The enemies you face just keep coming, and this creates a real sense of danger. You will find more ammunition and new weapons as you progress, but they will often only be enough to survive one or a handful of encounters, and boss fights can always be counted on to put a sizable dent in your supply. Developers go to great lengths to keep up this feeling of disempowerment. Ammunition for more powerful weapons often tends to be much more scarce. In games with melee weapons, they will usually be good for a small number of encounters before they break. Being too powerful or well supplied removes most if not all of the fear from the situation. Off the back of that last comment, another popular design choice is to put you in control of an ordinary person as a protagonist. Just to be clear, this does not always mean a person who is not in law enforcement or the military. What I mean is someone who cannot dodge roll bullet time a 10 foot stalker enemy, or block a chainsaw with a combat knife. Resident Evil 2 did this well, making your characters a college student and a police officer, but one who had precisely zero days of on the job experience. An everyman protagonist is more relatable to you, the player, who in a similar situation would also presumably be ill-equipped and unprepared for it. When Leon and Claire are firing round after round into the undead, only for them to persist, they will often express their disbelief at what is happening, just like we would. All of this is designed to reinforce their believability as civilian protagonists, and create that empathy bridge between us and them. Even as you progress further into the game, becoming better equipped and emboldened by your progress, your protagonist will have to deal with much larger and much faster enemies. When you're controlling someone who is not able to dodge roll in slow motion, an encounter with a liquor will soon put any burgeoning confidence you might be feeling back in check. Like all video games, there have to be elements that keep you hooked, that draw you in and make you actually want to keep moving forward. In the face of a challenge, making progress instills in us a belief that we can actually do what is necessary to achieve the outcome we want. This is called self-efficacy, and it's a big part of the psychology of facing and overcoming challenges in gaming. In scary games, this all has to be balanced with never allowing you, the player, to ever truly feel safe. Persistent ebbs and flow of tension are important to keep the player on edge, to keep that anxiety heightened, to keep that fight or flight instinct in play. It is also important to find a balance, and occasionally remove fear from the occasion altogether. The first time you entered a safe room, you instinctively knew that you were okay in there. The music is carefully curated to convey safety, to increase your levels of serotonin, the exact opposite of everything else you have encountered so far. In a scary game, why is this needed? Well, obviously, everyone needs a break at some point, and having a safe space to do so is just good game design. But from a psychological perspective, never letting you feel safe is not the same as having you constantly in a state of terror. Persistent ebbs and flows of tension, remember? Horror devs love to toy with our expectations. 
continually lulling you, not into a sense of safety, but perhaps of routine, as you learn your way around and pick up the pace, or of confidence after solving a string of puzzles, only to suddenly pull that rug right out from under you. Introducing a new enemy type, new enemies spawning in areas you have previously cleared enemies from, all popular techniques to keep your confidence in check. By far my favorite technique though, was the introduction of Crimson Heads in the Resident Evil remake. Decapitate the zombies or burn the bodies. Burning bodies requires two inventory slots and fuel, which is limited in supply. You simply cannot get them all. Non-burned, non-decapitated bodies just stay where they fall. They are the only enemy in the game whose corpses will persist after exiting a room. There is a formula that tells you how long it will take, but all you really need to know is eventually every one of those things will get back up and run, not shuffle, run at you like a bright red Edward Scissorhands. It will never matter how well you know the game. It will never matter how many times you play it through. It will never matter if you can play it through in your head from memory while stuck in a CAT scanner for 30 minutes. These are enemies that you cannot know. You do not know when they will strike, you just know that they will. The known is once again the unknown, and I'm going to close out this tension section by talking about possibly the biggest asshole in the entire Resident Evil universe. <laughs> oh yeah, that felt good. Just kidding. Mostly. Obviously, it's this guy. It's not just how relentless he is or how much of your ammo he wastes putting him down, or that he always seems to show up at the precise wrong moment. It's his footsteps. Even when he isn't all that close, you can hear them, and I swear half the time he's doing it just to toy with me. I'll get him! The game is kind enough to give you musical cues when he knows where you are that escalate into something extremely obvious when he has found you, but these do nothing to alleviate the anxiety you previously felt over not knowing where he is. Having him in the room with you is terrifying. The music is alarming to start with, but it then builds to a screeching crescendo, and then a persistent drum sequence. The message is clear, you are being hunted. There is no fight or flight here, he will not stop, therefore you must flight. Mr. X long overstays his welcome in my opinion, but even so, I cannot deny his effectiveness in maintaining that tension, that fear, all of what is needed to keep my anxiety high enough to sustain the experience. Strange. Such a little thing. That's her? Nicole? Yeah. First deferred from her in weeks. Often the goal in front of you will be, on the face of it, quite simple. Escape to safety, rescue a loved one, and then escape to safety, something like that. But is this enough to keep the player on their journey? Building a sense of intrigue throughout the adventure is an important part of making the player want to continue. Curiosity prepares the brain for learning. It activates the hippocampus, which is the region of the brain involved in creating memories. You are also, once again, rewarded with dopamine, encouraging you to continue learning. When we are able to learn something more quickly because it interests us, this is why. Scary games are usually all about the mystery. Why did the situation you're trapped in happen in the first place? Where did the horrors you're having to deal with come from? Who is responsible? The ostensibly simple goal you have of escape or save the loved one will almost always require you to solve these mysteries along the way. Usually, you will run into NPCs who can fill in some of the blanks for you, but only enough to keep you going. Characters who can explain the whole thing to you usually don't, as they prioritize their own agenda and or are killed before they are able to. A good mystery is fed to you using just the right amount of breadcrumbs that lead you through the path of many a thing that wants to kill you. But for the mystery to work, there has to be intrigue. For instance, what's the deal with these aliens? Why do I keep getting voodoo teleported to creepy locations? Why are they keeping sharks indoors? Why crocodiles so big? When did Inspector Gadget start juicing? 
And for the love of God, will they ever just let these two find some happiness? These are all mysteries I want to get to the bottom of. I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. As I mentioned at the start, the horror genre is a broad one. And like everything else in life, it won't appeal to everyone. If horror is your jam though, experiencing it through gaming puts you in control. And all of that adrenaline, all of that cortisol, all of that fight or flight is heightened because it is yours. And that cathartic release when you succeed will be all the sweeter for you having earned it. I am very, very aware that I have only covered an extremely small section of horror games in this video. I know that there are a number of games out there objectively far more terrifying than anything I have shown today. I know exactly how incontinence inducing it is to encounter the alien for the first time in Alien Isolation. The games I chose to talk about today are the ones I know best, and I chose them to support my work in an educated manner not because they are any better or worse than the other scary games that are out there. So, I invite you to tell me all about your favourite scary game experiences. Just because I didn't mention them here, it does not make them any less valid. Please remember though, fear is extremely subjective, and for some people, something far too real for it to ever be fun. So please, do remember to be kind. Thank you as always for watching and supporting my channel you guys. See you on the next one.